Anoush Manil from the JCI here with the delightful task of speaking with David Nathan, professor of Harvard Medical School and president emeritus of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute for the next in our series, Conversations with Giants in Medicine. Nathan is a renowned hematologist with contributions to the clinical treatments of beta thalassemia, sickle cell disease, chronic granulomatous disease, among others. He also contributed to the development of the first prenatal tests for hematological disorders. He's known as the consummate clinical investigator and mentor and a great wit. I hope we can learn a little bit more about his methods here today. Thank you so much for joining me today, David. Thank you. I'd love to start at the very beginning. What were you like as a child? Well, it was a dark and snowy night <laughs> and a physician struggled to get me delivered. No, it wasn't quite like that. No, uh, I have to say, though, that I've had a a boring geography. Uh, my family came to Boston in, just at the time of the Civil War, and we've been there ever since. Uh, and furthermore, uh, my family had an aversion to travel, particularly for children. Uh, my grandfather and my father, and by the way, my grandfather was an enormous influence on me because he lived with us. His wife died very early. Uh, both of those gentlemen uh, felt that travel was something that children shouldn't do. That children should go to school and do their work and be obedient <laughs> and uh, just uh, do their thing uh, and that Boston was fine. Uh, and so uh, we stayed. And I've stayed. Uh, we, I went to Harvard College in 1947 and I've been there ever since except for two years off for good behavior when I was at the National uh, uh, Cancer Institute. And, and beyond that, I've just been there. And it's been delightful. So tell me a little bit about when you first got interested in science, because wasn't there a famous tale that your grandfather didn't want your father to go into medical school, and maybe that trickled down to you a little? That's absolutely right. My father actually was admitted to the Harvard Medical School in 1921, uh, but, he, but my grandfather's position on doctors was absolutely fierce. He loathed doctors, and I can still hear him stamping around and saying, they're bums and loafers. They come, they drink your coffee, and they don't do a damn thing for you. And I, of course, he was right, uh, uh, ex except surgeons. He had great respect for surgeons. But he knew his son could not be a surgeon. He knew his son very well. And he was sure that he would never be a surgeon. So he absolutely forbade it. And my father went into the family business. Uh, so therefore, I became the target. There's no question about that. And as soon as I was in high school, uh, um, he, he began to talk about that. So quite naturally, when I went to Harvard, I decided I would absolutely not do that, that I would become an English professor, which completely <laughs> outraged my poor father. He was so against that. But I had the uniform. I mean, I had the plaid jacket. I had the leather on my elbows. I had a pipe. I had everything but the talent. <laughs> and uh, I was competing with the, with the then Radcliffe girls. And I can still hear Professor Harry Levin uh, in, in a Shakespeare class, uh, lecturing to us and saying, and with a hey, nani, 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 nani. And the Radcliffe girls were copying that down. And I realized this is not for me. Maybe I should take chemistry the way my father said. So I did. And I took all the pre-med courses while I still majored in English. And I think that was a very good experience for me because I read a lot. And uh, uh, I think it was, it was very beneficial. But I do thank uh, my father for pushing me. You mentioned at one point in an article you wrote that you did manage to finish a thesis on a terribly tedious Victorian poet. Oh, my thesis was a nightmare. I decided that the whole conflict of Huxley and Matthew Arnold was my conflict, the, the conflict between science and culture. I don't know why I thought that. I had no relationship really to either one of those gentlemen, and certainly not their accomplishments. But I thought that Arnold was the man who was being tortured. And so, and after all, Huxley was changing the curriculum in the universities radically. 
So uh, I decided to write about Arnold, and halfway through this laborious thesis, I realized I couldn't stand the man. He was so boring. And I went to my tutor. They, at Harvard assigned a tutor for each thesis writer. And it was John Kelleher, the, the, the great Irish uh, 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 expert, uh, Irish literature expert. And uh, I said, what shall I do? I can't stand this thesis. And I can still hear him. Ooh, he said, don't worry, boy. I can't stand the old bugger either. So we'll just forget about it. Just finish the damn thing. And I'll take you to Albionis. That was a, a short order food place in the square. And we'll have apple pie. And I'll read you Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> so that's how I spent my thesis tutorial, so listening to Kelleher. Because, by the way, you can't read Finnegan's Wake. Uh, it has to be read aloud. And no one could possibly understand that book. Uh, and he, of course, knew every illusion. And he read it so beautifully. So I enjoyed that immensely. And when the thesis was uh, done and I'd gotten my honors, I burned it in his, in his honor. He, he was a great man. I, and I appreciated that. And off I went to medical school. Did you enjoy medical school? I really loved the Harvard Medical School. At that time, the curriculum was really uh, very open. I mean, one, one went to class a lot, but there was time. And one could explore uh, clinical medicine uh, on one's own, actually. I used to go over to the Boston City Hospital, which was a Harvard service at that time, and uh, roam around and, and look at patients on a Tuesday afternoon or a Thursday afternoon. And um, I remember so well, I had, by the way, been admitted to the medical school because I'd been a social worker as, uh, while I was an undergraduate. And I, I really understood the healthcare problem in Cambridge, because that's where I worked, among lots of very poor people. And I had actually told Harvard that the reason I wanted to go to medical school was so that I could go back to Cambridge and start a group practice for these people. And that was a new idea. Uh, to, uh, that became, actually, much later, the Harvard Community Health Plan. But uh, that's, a, that's why they admitted me, not because I was such a great scientist, because I had only taken the basic courses. Uh, but I got on the ward, and there was a, a gentleman in a deep coma. And I turned to the resident and said, why is that man in a coma? And he said, well, we really don't know, but he goes into a coma right after lunch, and he stays that way for several hours. And I said, but, but why? He, well, as I said, he, I, we don't understand it. He's an alcoholic, and he has bad liver disease, and we're hearing from England that this may be related to ammonia metabolism, that there's something wrong with the way these patients handle amino acids, and the amino acids create ammonia, and they can't detoxify it. That's what we think, but we don't know because we can't measure ammonia. And that something electric light bulb went off in me. I went back to the biochemistry department and to pass, and I said, look, I, I got to look at this. I've got to develop a method that will allow me to measure uh, blood ammonia because this is too interesting. And that's what turned me into a clinical investigator. Uh, they gave me that stuff, and I developed that method and published it. And it, the whole idea of being a published scientist suddenly hit me. But of course, I really wasn't a scientist. What I was, and I think I still am, is a kid in a candy store. I am absolutely fascinated by strange patients. When I see an odd patient that I don't understand, my whole genetic apparatus starts to run around, and I got to find out what's going on with that patient. And I want what I find out to lead to something I can do about it. Uh, if it's a gene, then if I can't replace it, and of course when I started out that was impossible, maybe I can get around it in some way. Uh, or I can prevent it, or I can do something uh, that's useful. That's how I see clinical research. Now there are 
so many different kinds of clinical researchers. Uh, everyone is different. Uh, each one has a different approach. But that's my approach. See the patient, find out what's wrong, do something about it. That's what I enjoy doing. Well, can I ask then, how did you decide to focus on hematology? Ah, uh, hematology was an interesting story. About the last thing I wanted to do was hematology. Although Dr. Castle ran the course at the Harvard Medical School, and he was a great man, frankly, it was a boring course, and I didn't like it. I, was, I wanted to be a gastroenterologist uh, and because, after all, I was interested in liver disease. But I went to the National Cancer Institute, uh, and by the way, you have no idea what that was like. Uh, people take for granted that today that, that the facilities in a major medical center will actually be somewhat modern. But in Boston, at the time I was being trained, it was a nightmare. It was absolutely Dickensian. I mean, the Brigham Hospital, where I was an intern, was simply dreadful. I remember my mother coming in as a patient and signing out against advice. She couldn't stand the place. You had to be a Marine to be a patient there. It was 30 beds on a ward, uh, separated no by little thin uh, linen drapes. Uh, at night, it was me, the intern, a student nurse, a senior resident roaming through the whole dirty place, uh, running the medical service, supervising me, and the most important person of all, the, the uh, nursing supervisor. That woman knew everything, and she went all over the place to uh, correct me when I was wrong. She would find me EKG machines. She would open the laboratory for me so I could do the, the studies. By the way, the bed rate in that time, at that time was about $30 a day. I was paid $25 a month. The student nurse got nothing. The nursing supervisor got $3,500 a year. And, and look at where we are now. Yeah. Uh, the, if you wonder about costs, just think back on those days. But anyway, I went from, from there. I was married uh, when I started medical school. And by the time I was an intern, uh, we had two children, and it was either go to Korea uh, in the Army or go to NIH, and I, that was a very simple decision for me. We moved to Bethesda, and I did a year of clinical work, which was really clinical research work, learning how to do cancer trials, and uh, that because combination chemotherapy was just beginning at that point. It, it was really an idea, not even a, a trial. It, it was being developed. And, uh, but I, I was promised that in the second year, I could do whatever research I wanted to do. And you have to understand that they had just built Building 10, the great clinical center, which is still there. And what a magnificent place. I mean, it was something I had never seen anything like it. It was beautiful. with. 350 or more beds, maybe 400, all research beds, all beautiful rooms, uh, uh, laboratories right across the hall. Uh, I mean, it's simply amazing place. Nurses who knew, knew what they were doing were actually getting paid. I mean, it, it, it was a, it, and even I was getting paid. It, 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 was a, it was just a new world. I loved it. But I wanted to do ammonia metabolism. And uh, I went to see the chief of the service, then great uh, uh, Zub, uh, Gordon Zubrod, really a wonderful man. And I told him what I wanted to do in my second year. And he said, well, that's interesting, but I want you to work with Dr. Berlin, who's just arrived to run the metabolism service. And you can do metabolism, but it may not necessarily be ammonium metabolism. And I said, well, okay, I'll deal with Dr. Berlin. I certainly wasn't going to argue with Dr. Zubrod. So I went to Dr. Berlin. And he was rocking back in uh, his GI chair. He was a small man. He could fold himself up like a Buddha and rock back and forth. And he looked at me and said, well, now tell me something, uh, Dr. Nathan. How many stripes would you have on your sleeve? 
and uh, if you were in uniform? And I said, I knew my rank, and I said, two. And he said, that's right. Now, how many would I have? And I knew that he'd come as a Navy captain. Uh, that was the equivalent rank. So I said, four. He said, good, you can actually do arithmetic. Very good. That's why you're going to be a hematologist in this laboratory starting right away. <laughs> so you were ordered into hematology. <laughs> Absolutely ordered in. I was quite angry for about two days until I started doing the work. And uh, two of my cl excellent classmates, Sherm Weissman and Tom Waldman, uh, both of whom are still actively doing research today, uh, were in the lab. We had a great time and I learned a lot and I became, sort of fell in love with hematology and I've been doing it ever since. So you're now a hematologist. You're back in Boston. What did you decide to focus your work on? No, I went, I, I did something probably very foolish. Uh, I was offered, first of all, I had to do my senior residency, which I did. And during that residency, I saw my first adult with thalassemia. And it was a, a patient with what we now know as thalassemia intermedia. He absolutely fascinated me. And I said, that's it. I'm going to study this, this problem. Not quite realizing that, there, that thalassemia intermedia might be somewhat rare and that it might be difficult to see a lot of patients, but I knew that's what I wanted to do because that was, that was a disorder that truly interested me. And after the senior residency, I was sort of given a junior staff position and uh, instead of going off to a lab to get better basic training. And I just thought, I love independence. I'm going to just do it. I made up for that later, but I think it wasn't the right way to get trained. Anyway, I began, and uh, uh, I learned something from that patient and others like him, which I actually got from Children's Hospital. Some of their patients had grown up, and some of them had thalassemia intermedia, and I began to study them very carefully. The other thing that, I, of course, in that candy store that I was seeing was kidney transplantation and anephric patients. So I note for the record, not only do you have the most JCI publications of anyone that I've interviewed, but there was a particular publication on your CV in 1964 that stood out to me, Erythropoiesis in Anephric Man. Yes. So there was a time before everyone realized where hematopoiesis occurred. Everyone thought it was renally. Well, the, the yes, I mean, the, Good studies that have been done in Chicago really pinpointed the kidney as the source of erythropoietin. But there was still a question about it. And, the, and in man, it was a real question because nobody knew. But I got these patients who had been accidentally nephrectomized. Accidentally? There was the most important one was a man who had a mass in his flank. And he went into a community hospital and the surgeon said, you have a mass in your flank. And I know surgery, when you have a mass, it's probably cancer, and I should take it out. So he took out this man's solitary kidney, uh, which had, of course, hypertrophied. And there's this poor young man, now nephrectomized, and comes into the Brigham Hospital, because that's where we do transplants. And I got my, that's what that paper is all, really largely about that man. There are a couple of other patients who were nephrectomized uh, prior to, to uh, getting a transplant who had chronic renal disease, so they were less dramatic. But the evidence showed very clearly that you didn't need a kidney to make erythropoietin. And it was clearly that the liver was a site. Now, we didn't prove that it was the liver, but there was certainly erythropoietin. You know, it seems like from your stories, patient after patient that you saw these puzzling cases then changed and shaped the way that you approached research. That, that's right. I mean, that's, that, some would say, is a lesion. Some would say you should be focused. You shouldn't pay any attention to the fact that somebody just came in nephrectomized because he lost, and, and, and because you shouldn't divert yourself. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I felt that my, yeah, everybody has to make his own contribution in his own way. And, uh, uh, that's my way. If I see something that I think I can learn something from, if I have the tools and the patient is right there, I'm going to, I'm going to deal with it. And, and you know, with, with the thalassemics, the, the big question was, what's the role of fetal hemoglobin? And I found out 
that it was terribly important that red cells that had a lot of fetal hemoglobin in, in them, in thalassemia, survive a lot better. And so the answer for thalassemia is fetal hemoglobin. And sure enough, today, my colleagues are really going to make that happen. Not right now, but soon. Uh, and I've been thinking fetal hemoglobin ever since then. In fact, the whole reason why I introduced hydroxyurea into sickle cell anemia treatment years later was because it's always been on my mind. I just didn't know what to do about it. But that idea came up due to work other members of our society did. Uh, Tim Lay, Art Nienhuis, George Stamatoyanopoulos, everybody was worried about it. Uh, and and uh, I got to do hydroxyurea and that was a big contribution. So I think you can make contributions by being a kid in the candy store. It's risky. And most people would say it's not the way to do it. The thing to do is to focus on a problem, stay with that problem. So you wrote once, I've trained or did not interfere with <laughs> some of the best hematologists in the world. Yeah. And I've also read any number of different tributes to you with many different anecdotes about funny things that you did. So it also seems, if I can interject into your recipe for mentorship, that there's a certain amount of humor that has to go along with the relationship. Yeah, I think that if you take life too seriously, it's no fun at all. And I think you've got to sort of make fun of some things because, after all, this is a crazy life. Who would do this? I mean, we work for hour after hour after hour. We don't get paid terribly well. We, we have a series in the big cities, big costs, educational costs. Things are getting much more complicated. If, if you don't try to make it amusing, it, it, and it is amusing because the, 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 the whole enterprise has got a, an enormous amount of real humor to it, even though you're dealing with, with uh, uh, terribly serious problems. I've tried to keep it light, you know, and hope that the young people, that is the physicians, won't get too bound up in some of the real problems. Is it true that one of the first times you met Ed Benz, who's the current president, <laughs> of the Dana-Farber, you made him pay for his lunch and well, yours? <laughs> that's before the ATA. He tells that story constantly. Now, it's true. <laughs> I, I did. He, now, there was a good example of a young man who wanted to do molecular biology. And he was a Harvard student. And the, the Harvard, back, you know, the Harvard uh, basic science folks said, well, you can't do it in humans. It, it isn't ready. You've got to do germs. And uh, you got to use model systems. It's just not ready. And uh, I didn't feel that way. I felt we could get somewhere. And uh, he came over to, I invited him over for lunch. But uh, my wife is the person who, before ATMs, who always gave me my money for the day. And, and uh, uh, she hadn't given me any money. So poor Ed had to pay for the lunch. <laughs> he hasn't forgotten that. But he did very, very well. By the way, that brings up something. One of the reasons Ed did so well was because I began to see that, that we needed much more technology if we were going to deal with this. And uh, I was running the division uh, at, at Children's. And I went over to MIT to, because I knew that faculty over there might be more adventurous about dealing with human disease. And I went to Harvey Lodish and David Baltimore's laboratory. They had a, they had a joint laboratory, a small space filled with brilliant people. And we started on the thalassemia problem. And Ed and others were enormous beneficiaries of that. That technology got transferred. And, and I've been working with the MIT folks ever since. They're really very, very good. So that's another byproduct. You have to you have to go for you have to be willing to change your technology, learn new methods, and, and that means collaboration with people who have such techniques. I believe in that. You've always been an advocate for patient oriented clinical investigation. In fact you wrote something in the JCI that's quite clever about POTSIs. Yes. Right? What does that stand for? Patient oriented 
translational clinical investigators. Now, so you've been the champion of this, and in yeah. fact, Harold Varmus, when he was director of the NIH, asked you to lead the NIH panel on clinical research. Yeah. What did you recommend, and what of their recommendations did they take? Well, that was a great opportunity. First of all, Harold was enormously committed to it, and he really made our committee successful. He put his heart and soul into that. And and he also gave me a great committee, uh, among them uh, Gene Wilson, who really was a huge contributor. And uh, we, what we came up with was something pretty simple, and that is the kids needed to not be in debt. By this time, you have to remember, when I went to Harvard Medical School, my father thought it was an outrage that the tuition was $800. Hmm. Okay. And uh, these kids are paying, my grandson's going to medical school, uh, and it's going to be $50,000. So it is impossible for these kids. They, they have to be debt relieved. And secondly, they needed grants. They needed to have a set of grants set up that, that they could get that would give them uh, a start. And that's really what we did. It was very uncomplicated, but very effective. Over the years, you've written books and essays about particularly inspirational patients yeah. um, and concurrently your path of discovery through that. And in an essay you wrote recently, um, there was a phrase that, that I starred next to it as I was reading it, because it was particularly indicative of your brash, um, witty, eloquent, and very memorable style, and it reads as this. Four decades ago, when I was a brash 40-year-old physician, I pledged to his parents that I would not rest until he was on a course that would permit him to outlive me. In retrospect, that promise was the product of hubris or suicidal ideation. <laughs> you have such a way with words. Yeah. Well, that's Howard. And, and I did write a book about Howard uh, when he reached his 30th birthday. And now he's in his 50s, and he's one of the most successful restaurateurs in, in Washington. And, uh, go to Sushi Co. In, in Chevy Chase. It's the best restaurant, absolutely wonderful. Anyway, Howard came as this little sick six-year-old with a hemoglobin of one and a half and somehow struggling along. And there was something about that boy. I just felt he represents everything I want to do. I, I know I can't fix him the way he should be fixed. I can't do gene therapy, uh, uh, although that's coming now. Uh, uh, but I can, I can do something. I can fix him as best I can. And I can use every technique that I've got to do it. And I have seen this boy respond to all of that. We, I mean, the book describes the field and him. And uh, he's a symbol to me. In fact, I'm having a, an 85th birthday party and he's coming, and he's going to talk to the group about what it is to be a patient and what modern medicine has done for him. And it has. We've used every trick in the book to get this guy viable. And the pharmaceutical industry has done their thing. He's alive because of oral iron chelators. We didn't have those when we started. So it is a great story. There has been a tremendous amount of, of, of growth in our field. And in every field, we're moving. And he, he really represents it. And yes, it was the idea that he was going to live to be his 50s was, was hubris. But there he is. And we did it. Well, it was well-placed hubris then. Yeah, yeah it was. And, and I think the patients today are getting huge amounts out of this. Now, you're a gifted writer and noted wit, and even our email exchanges just in, in uh, <laughs> arranging this interview tickled me. Would you ever have pursued further training in English literature or writing if you weren't 
a medical doctor and a scientist? If you had to do it all over again and you couldn't be a scientist, what do you think you would have chosen? Oh, I would have, I, I would have tried, uh, probably, but I would have never made it in English literature. And the reason I wouldn't have made it is the standards were too high. Honestly, uh, if you had to have a summa cum laude uh, performance at Harvard College to even have a chance to get into the graduate school. The Yale and Harvard graduate schools in English literature were amazing. I mean, the quality of the people were quite extraordinary. So, no, I don't, I, I think that would have been like me wanting to be the quarterback on, on, in the Boston, in the New England Patriots. It, it, was, it wasn't going to happen. I didn't have the talent. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending this time with me, David. It was fun and fantastic to hear a little bit more about you. <laughs> Thanks.